1968, uh, I wanted to become a school teacher. And I went to a school where they teach you how to become a teacher. Yeah. And the first year I was dressed up with suit and tie and going to school every day and very neatly. And then the second year in 69, I started to smoke some marijuana and that changed my life completely. In 1970, I came to a youth center here close by, and uh, it was uh, a youth center where a lot of young people came, and we took over the youth center and we made our own rules and we experimented a lot with uh, with uh, LSD and uh, smoked a lot of hash, and that's also where I met uh, Kurt van Es. And it was a real nice time. In the 60s, you had a very different climate from now. Especially San Francisco and Amsterdam were so-called actually the capitals of the cultural climate in those days of the 60s. There were a lot of changes going on, but nobody knew where to go and everybody knew that things had to be different, but nobody knew how to do it. In 72, there was a group of, of friends uh, from a Jew center somewhere here in Amsterdam they opened a building or a tea or coffee shop, a tea room. And they at first they just sold to friends, friends from friends, etc. And they came and they, they bought hashes there. And it was sort of allowed. It was the tolerant atmosphere at the time. Uh, but they didn't have the idea of really opening a, a, a commercial thing. But it just so happened and it developed and it became the first coffee shop which was called Mellow Yellow. So in those days if you wanted to buy hash or grass you had to go to places where a lot of smokers come together because uh, wherever there were a lot of smokers there were also a lot of dealers and um, buying hash and grass in those days was rather difficult. You had to know the prices, you had to know the qualities, uh, you had to negotiate about prices and such and such. I started to live with a couple of uh, friends of mine on, uh, on a, an Amsterdam, in an Amsterdam house and soon more and more friends came to that house and after a while we were living in that house with nine people and we were all smokers. And as you know, when you have a lot of smokers together, there's also a lot of dealing going on. And what we used to do was we used to go and buy hash and grass and then sell it to our friends in order to have some hash and grass for ourselves for free. Because that was sort of the, the sport in those days. We always used to make uh, tea for the visitors and uh, the joke was always uh, why not start a tea house or a coffee shop because then we can make some money on selling the coffee and the tea. You know? So uh, in 1973, that's what I did. Um, we uh, rented a house and um, we uh, made it into a coffee shop and we called it Tea House Mellow Yellow. And the idea was that uh, a tea house sounds a little less tough than a coffee shop and so that everybody would know that something fishy was going on in the tea house. <laughs> and Mellow Yellow was sort of a, a code name because uh, it was a popular song of Donovan in those days and the idea was that uh, if you had nothing to smoke you could bake the banana peels and smoke that and that supposedly make you high and we thought that if we call it Mellow Yellow ordinary people would be not suspicious about it but every hippie yeah, would know that it had something to do with cannabis. Uh, we appointed one of us who was sitting in front of the bar pretending he was just a visitor and he was the only dealer that was allowed in the house. And we pretended he was just a visitor. But everybody who visited our place knew that he was one of us, so you could trust the dealer in the house. So it made buying hash and grass very simple because you did not need to negotiate. Uh, you just asked the dealer, what do you have? And he would sum up uh, Lebanese, Moroccan, uh, Thai weed, blah, 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 blah. And then you would just repeat one of those names and say, give me 10 or 25 guilders of it. Huh? We were visited by hundreds and thousands of people. And of course, there were also people there that saw what we were doing and thought to themselves, you know, that's a nice idea that these hippies have. Uh, and we can do that also and we can do it better. So in 1975, 
the second coffee shop opened in Amsterdam, that was the Rusland. And a couple of months later, the third coffee shop opened and that was the Bulldog. They were much more commercial than we were. We were just hippies and the all, all we wanted was to have a nice time and lots of free smoke and we were not into money that much, you know. And they opened up 10 o'clock in the morning and went on until 10 o'clock at night. And they commercialized the whole system. And after that, it was easy to copy. And uh, soon dozens and eventually hundreds of coffee shops opened up in Amsterdam and all over Holland. <coughs> And then in 76, legislation was really changed in Holland. Possession of 30 grams of hashes was allowed. And uh, there was no real prosecution of people who just smoked hashes and marijuana. And the idea behind that was, uh, which is the foundation actually of the Dutch drug policy, is to, to, to keep hash and marijuana smokers from the dealers from, uh, within, in heroin and cocaine. This was the idea, to separate the markets. Gradually more coffee shops opened the door, but it was until early 80s that the law was published in Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Utrecht, other cities, in the countryside, everywhere, till about a maximum of about 5, 1,500, I guess, we were about 1,500 coffee shops in Holland. In uh, 1978, we had a fire in the coffee shop and I had nothing to do for a while because it was completely burned out. So I went over to the States and um, yeah, I uh, came into a scene of American hippies. And the strange thing about it was that they were growing their own marijuana. Um, I was used that marijuana and hash were imported from third world countries. And um, these Americans, they were growing their own varieties of marijuana and they were growing them without seeds. And they called it Cincimilia, which is Spanish for without seeds. And the most important thing was that this marijuana was so good that they got lots more money for it than from the illegal import. We were smoking this Cincimilia over there in America. And then the idea was, you know, uh, Holland has a lot of coffee shops now, but they constantly need to import their hash and marijuana from third world countries and it would be much nicer if we would uh, grow our own locally. We started uh, what we what I call the Cincimilia guerrilla and that was very small uh, growing scenes all over Holland and then I had to sell this product in uh, to the Dutch coffee shops and that was in 1980. Gradually we grew more and more and more until 1985, then we grew about 500 kilos a year and it became like business. And then I thought, mm, I don't like this game anymore. I'm not here on this earth to uh, become um, an illegal grower or something like that. And um, I stopped uh, with uh, growing marijuana. All the, the focus of police and justice at the time, in the 70s and also in the 80s, was aimed at um, trade and usage of heroin and cocaine. But the, st the, st the strange thing with coffee shops is that on one side you are allowed to enter the front door, go in and buy up to 30 grams. But the deliverance, the suppliance of the, of the, of the hashes and marijuana at the back door was still forbidden. If people had a coffee shop, they were allowed to have about 30 grams, which was not enough, of course, for all the customers, so they had more supplies. But this was officially not allowed. And then they were forced to do, to, to do business with organizations or with people who sold them the hashes and marijuana, but we were unofficial and were hidden, hidden traders, you understand that? They actually would have liked to do business with official people, but it was not possible. So this is a strange thing of the Dutch policy. Uh, I work uh, in a coffee shop uh, four and a half years. I started when I was uh, 20 years 
of age. It's a place where you can buy, uh, yeah, you can buy hashis and weed, and uh, you can uh, have a nice uh, time talking with other people. You can smoke a joint. Uh, the people that come uh, in the coffee shops, uh, it depends a little bit where it is. In this, the coffee shops in the center, it's uh, lots of tourists, of course. Dutch people come here, it's like all kinds of people. It's, you have uh, lawyers, teachers, businessmen, uh, artists, uh, just any kind of people. Many people think uh, marijuana is uh, totally legal here in Holland, but it's uh, actually still, it's never have been legal. It's always like semi-legal, so uh, that's why in a coffee shop you can sell marijuana legally to a customer, but for a, co a coffee shop to buy the amounts that they need to sell, it's uh, illegal because you can only buy five grams. But uh, of course, coffee shop, uh, they sell, uh, well, some coffee shops in the center, when there's many tourists, they sell a kilo a day or something. So that means in, uh, in a coffee shop, you can only, only have uh, half a kilo of marijuana. So that, that means uh, that the wheat that we sell has to come from something a few times a day. So uh, what happens, uh, and many people think coffee shops grow wheat themselves, but that's also not true. Uh, co coffee shops, they have uh, people, they know people, and they grow inside in their house illegally, because uh, you can only grow five plants in Holland. But you need much more uh, to, to sell to coffee shops to make kilos. So uh, that happens uh, indoor, because the, the weather is not uh, nice in Holland as well. So uh, there's in Holland there are really lots of uh, people who have a bedroom and they uh, put like 40 plants in it to uh, grow weed. And uh, they have contact with coffee shop boss and they sell it to the boss. And then uh, when we need some weed here we can order it and then they uh, bring it, yeah, like on the scooter they come to bring uh, 100 grams. So you can sell the next four hours, you can sell the weed. And, uh, yeah, so, and that's also illegal. The guy who brings the weed, that's, uh, he has to be really careful that he doesn't uh, get caught by, some, by the police or something. And then if, if that happens, it's really risky for a coffee shop. And uh, yeah, and then if you get the weed here, we uh, put it uh, in the system and then uh, we sell it. That's uh, how we do it. Yeah. So if you're a boss from a coffee shop, you really have to have uh, international connections. So this is quite illegal to do but it's uh, it's a necessary necessary thing because hash is really uh, a lot of ask a, lo a lot of question for the hash really comes from Morocco or from Asia and uh, the people who work in the coffee shops we don't know anything about it so the boss is really he leaves us out of it so uh, yeah but it's like yeah it's like half yeah halfly criminal organization you have to be so it's uh, lo lots of risk to have coffee shop uh, as a boss, you know. So especially now, the last ten years when they're really uh, they're trying everything to close coffee shops down in uh, Holland. One little mistake and you have to close. Well, it's nearly 40 years now that the first coffee shop was opened. So many people who live now actually have lived in a in, in a country where coffee shops existed all the time. You're allowed now only the possession of five grams. Politicians have more or less forgotten about their uh, drug policy, why it was organized the way it was. My name is Michael Veling, I'm 53 years old and I'm the proprietor of Coffee Shop 420 Cafe in Amsterdam. I've been here for 23 years and I've been active in the cannabis business for almost 40 years. In Holland we have a unique thing we have a open sale of cannabis from licensed public places, checked by the government, inspected by the government. Um, and the idea behind it is to make sure that the cannabis consumer is not uh, confronted with pills and powders, so-called hard drugs. And as far as I can tell, this system works perfect. The beauty of a, uh, of a public place where you can sell an illegal substance is that you can also make an arrangement with the tax office meaning that the money I make can be taxed. It is not considered to be criminal money. It's not considered to be black money. The only reason why I got a license from the local government to sell an illegal substance from a public place is because I was on a list of suspected sellers of cannabis on the 1st of April 1995. 
after the 1st of April 1995, no new coffee shops have, to, have opened up in Amsterdam. So you cannot open a coffee shop, but you can buy one. You can take over a coffee shop. We smoked in high school and we've been smoking ever since. And when I bought a bar 23 years ago, I immediately introduced cannabis as well. So I could do away with all the, uh, the riffraff, the scum, uh, slot machines, and I could just make it as relaxed as it still is today after 23 years. Until 13 years ago, the sale of cannabis in public places was done under the table. It was not as open as it is today. And apparently we liked it. The government liked it, the politicians liked it, the police liked it, the uh, district attorneys liked it, the judges liked it. And it didn't do any harm to society. The sign that's outside on the window uh, of, of, of a green and white banner with a number in it, that is, the, uh, um, that is meant for the police so, they, so that they can identify this public place as a shop where an illegal substance is um, sold. It comes with the license and by the way you can't call the license a license it's it's a letter in which the mayor states that I know you to be a drug dealer but as long as you stick to a few rules we will not prosecute you. That is in essence the coffee shop. But in doing so, the, uh, the government is, of course, uh, whether they like it or not, they are a partner in crime. I like that. of February of this year, President Obama stopped federal American police of busting uh, medical marijuana clubs in uh, America. There are about 13 states now in America that have a medical marijuana law, which allows uh, shops to sell to patients that, have, that are registered. And the system is uh, set up typically American, it's so that you can then go to special doctors and they'll give you a prescription. And of course, because in America everything works with money, they advertise saying, come to me and I'll give you a prescription, $150. With this prescription, the patient goes to, uh, to an official uh, institution called Public Health Service and they get a little pass, a medical marijuana pass. And you can also get two extra passes for friends of yours that can go to the club and get your medicine when you're not able. So in reality, it means that a lot of doctors are making a lot of money and these people, they bring in their friends uh, and they're all allowed inside these medical marijuana clubs in America. And these marijuana clubs, they have like 30, 40 varieties. And in Holland, we call them coffee shops, but over there they use the medical marijuana thing. We can safely assume that in four years time, there'll be thousands and thousands of these clubs and maybe millions and millions of Americans that are so-called medical marijuana patients. So, war is over. Mm -hmm.